so very happy to wish you a very happy Easter this Resurrection Sunday. Uh, this morning, we're going to take up once again the study of 1 Peter. We've chosen this theme of a living stone for our Easter celebration. And we have been reading uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, and last week we began on 1 Peter chapter 2 for the last two months to explore, to ponder who Jesus is as a living stone. For Jesus is the center of our celebration of what Easter is. And this is why we have taken time to do this. And so once again, we are going to pray and, and to read the Lord's Word together on this Easter morning. Well, let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your protection this week. We thank you for providing and all the things that we have, perhaps basic things that we have taken for granted, which now have become a luxury, where we have food, where we have health, that we can still be able to speak of you as our God in this time. We thank you that we can celebrate Easter meaningfully by looking at to the Lord Jesus and to fill our heart and our mind with who He is and what He's come to do. We ask that you would bless us this Easter with a word to, for all of us to look forward to the days ahead with faith and with hope. Bless, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. I must say, it has been a wonderful time this Easter to discover more about Christ and to dwell on Him. The whole challenge of how Christ is the center of our Easter celebration has become even more uh, obvious because there is nothing else. There is no holiday to go to. There is no Easter musical. There is absolutely uh, nothing else but to go back to the center of what Easter is truly all about. We're almost made to do this. And it's not something that is burdensome. It, is not a, it, it was not something that was boring. It was, in fact, most refreshing. And so we couldn't have the usual special Easter services that we normally do. And so uh, I took up the challenge of doing something new and to write. And so this week I wrote four pastoral articles, which is my personal record. And um, it has been... Uh, Wonderful, I say, because it has literally made me sit down and think of what Easter truly is all about. And this morning, I want to share with you from 1 Peter the lessons that we can learn from here. And there are many lessons to learn from Peter. How did Peter cope with the suffering for his faith and not lose hope? How did Peter cope as he see the church scattered, isolated? They were not able to gather for worship. They were not able to sing together, much like what we are experiencing today. Notice Peter did not focus on singing. As much as we miss singing, his focus was not singing. Notice 
Peter's focus was not the physical gathering of the church as much as we miss that too. Those are good in normal times. But we are looking at hard times. What was his focus? And his focus was to teach knowledge of God, to share insights of who Christ is, and to encourage people to grow in their faith. For this will help a whole great deal. This must be our focus as well. And so we are going to look and learn from Peter, right? In very much the same way as we are battling COVID-19, the health professionals, the scientists are studying how some of the people and how they recovered. How come some people take it harder? Some people die and some survive it and emerge stronger. What is it that is inside them that enables them to beat and overcome this virus? And they are hoping to find antibodies. They are hoping to find a vaccine that will help all of us in time to come. And we are praying that that time will come soon so less lives will be lost. But of course, in a very similar way, what is inside Peter that enables him to help him to cope with pain, suffering like this and not give up as he did in the past and not be overcome by fear and panic as he did in the past. What made him stronger? I must tell you, it's not experience. Sometimes past experience make you even more fearful. Those who have gone through the hard times, they have seen this. That fear can be there because they know how serious the problem can be. But what made Peter this time stronger than before? And we must take note, it is found in what he has been writing all this while in his letter, which we have been reading. Right? And look at this. In chapter 1 and verse 3, we go back you would see Peter's faith is centered in Christ. We can speak of having faith in God, but do we really have a Christ-centered faith? What is a Christ-centered faith? Now, let's take a look. And chapter 1, verse 3, Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again through a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, in Easter, we don't just celebrate the resurrection of Christ, which we do. We think of His life, we ponder the significance of His death, but we, we ponder the significance of Christ's res resurrection and we believe in it. But how does our faith affect us ultimately? Is it inside us? Does it create in us a living hope? That's what it is. A Christ-centered faith will see you have a living hope, a hope that is alive, a hope that will enable you to cope. Now, 
let's go on further to see this faith in, uh, in reality. Right? In verse 7, the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise, the honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you see this? Whole idea of a Christ-centered faith through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ mentioned again, this faith is real, it is precious to you. We call this a living faith. Faith and hope is connected. When Peter talked about a living hope, on the other side, there is a living faith in the Lord. It is real, it is alive, it is dynamic. It is certainly not dead. It is certainly not just a historical or a profession of faith. It lives inside us. That's what having a Christ-centered faith is all about. Right? Look at this. Okay? And in verse 8 now, whom having not seen, this is a reference to Jesus, you love. Though you do not see Him, Watch how alive this faith is. Yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible, full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. This is a Christ-centered faith. And so if we are going to be able to cope, we need a Christ-centered faith. Where faith in Christ see that this hope is alive inside us. This faith is living inside us. It is expressed, it is exercised. What else is a Christ-centered faith? Now, we move on quickly to chapter 2. Where Peter writes and says, coming to him, now, we read this earlier, last week. Coming to Him, to Jesus, as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God. Precious, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. See, He, Christ, is that living stone, our foundation is Christ, the foundation of our life. What holds us together? What keeps us strong? What will make us stand firm? This faith is rooted deeply in Christ. He is that living stone, that chief cornerstone that is mentioned here. Do we see this? That's what a Christ-centered faith is. And that is what we need to appreciate and to have. Now, this morning, we are going to read on further in this text. Right? Christ-centeredness must be there. But how do we actually understand this in life? we got to go back. How does it relate to us? This is Christ. But how does that, how does Christ relate with us? Now, this is a wonderful uh, word over here. And that word is the word chosen. You will see this word come again and again and again. We go back to chapter 1 where Peter begins with elect according to the foreknowledge of God. A reference to the people of God. This is the word chosen. Right? The coming to him a living stone, chosen by God, reference to Jesus, 
who was rejected by man. He was chosen by God and precious. Here is Christ. His foundation. Our challenge is to be built up in Christ. Chosen and built up. What are we chosen for? What were we chosen to do? And the, and the challenge here is the word built up. Built up a spiritual household. Do you see this? Built up. And our challenge is to understand this. That God is building up a spiritual household in Christ. This is not with reference to a physical building. This is with reference to a people. So when we talk about our faith in Christ, it is, yes, one, personal, but it is also, two, people. We've got to see the big picture. It's like what we are going through now. Each one of us is being asked by the government to do our part. And if we all do our part as individuals, we are going to make an impact as a nation, as a people to beat this virus. But if we don't respond appropriately as individuals, it is, of course, going to affect everybody else. So we mustn't just think of ourselves, but we must think people. Now, we are going to see this a bit more. Okay? Now, let's go on further in verse 9. And this is this morning's message on this Easter Sunday. To see what God is doing. Not what Christ, what God has done in the past, which we celebrate at Easter, in raising Jesus from the dead. But what God continues to do today. What He continues to do today. And what He is continuing to do today is to build up for himself, a special people. And we are going to see this. In verse 9, you are a chosen generation. See, the word chosen is there. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. That's what God is doing in and through the power of the resurrection of Christ today. His own precious, special people. The idea here is that God is the one building up His people. And these are precious possessions of God, these people. What are the distinctive features of God's special people? And there are three that is mentioned here. This is what we want to look at. How do I know? How do I understand these, uh, that this is God's people? You will be able to see it for yourself. These are the distinctive features of God's special people. Number one, a chosen generation. See, the word generation here is not a reference to age, like the younger generation or the older generation. It is not a reference to the X generation or the Y generation or the iPhone generation. The word generation can actually be translated as a word race. Right? 
the Asian race, the Caucasian race, or what the human race, that's ethnic group. But we are talking about the human race as a whole. Right? As a whole. But this is not about the human race. This is about a special race that God has is building. It begins with being born again. In a, a new life is given. This very much is what we call a Christian race. What are the distinctive features of God's spiritual race? This is not a physical thing. This is a spiritual race. A chosen generation. Every race has a distinctive have distinctive features. What is the distinctive feature of this particular race we call a chosen generation? If we recall what Jesus taught, when He says, bless are the poor in spirit. When, you, when we remember the, the beatitude, the list of characteristics, poor in spirit, meek, merciful, pure in heart, and you know what? It even includes, blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake and they will still hold firm to their faith. All these characteristics are distinctive of what a chosen generation is. And so we learn, what is God doing? He is, as it were, yes, saving lives, saving souls, but He's also building. He is building a chosen generation. That next part, a royal priesthood. That's what it is. A king, in other words, a kingly priesthood. There is royalty. There is a royal bloodline. The Lord Jesus Christ is king. Bless, and then he says, Poor in spirit, they're poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of God. How wonderful it is to know. This is what Easter is all about when we celebrate our faith in Christ. This is God's plan. And what Jesus did was a critical part of fulfilling that but we got to see the fullness of that plan. And that fullness includes this. Includes the people of God being built. A chosen generation, a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood, the priesthood would tell us that we are part of that priesthood whom Jesus is the great high priest. Where is Jesus today? Not on the cross. That's why we don't have a crucifix with Jesus nailed to the cross. Where is Jesus today? One, in our heart, in our midst, in the church, in spirit. Two, in heaven, in the right hand of God as our great high priest, interceding for us. We are His royal priesthood. Think about that. These are uplifting thoughts. And then three, a holy nation. In other words, a, a nation of God's people. This is, of course, a spiritual nation where our citizenship is not that on earth, is a heavenly citizenship. Now we think of what we see today, where every country is protecting their citizens. Right? They are flying them home. They're doing whatever they can. They're pouring whatever money, funds, 
everything, everybody, for the sake that their citizens will be safe, that the country can go on. Well, this is not a physical citizenship. We have a heavenly citizenship. And that distinctive feature of this spiritual nation is that of holiness to God. Right? What is the characteristics of an Australian? What is the characteristics of a Singaporean? There are certain characteristics of an Indian or Burmese. There are certain characteristics. What are the characteristics of a Christian? There must be. And this is what God is doing. So we are to look for this. We talk about being built up. To be what? To be a special people for Himself. That's what God is doing. Christ-centeredness. Chosen, we are called elect. Chosen for what? Now we see a fuller picture. To be built up a spiritual household, a special people to God. Now, we come to the third part of this passage, which is our part. And our part is vital. Now, we read on further, further, right? That, this is the response, this is the purpose, that you, us, may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. We have Christ-centeredness. We have God choosing us, and His plan is there, is clear to build us up. Now, how is it applied? Those are the plan of God. But how does that plan become a reality? It is again in Christ. When the Lord calls us. You see the word here? Called us. So chosen before the foundation of the world. Chosen, we didn't know this. Now we come to know it. It is revealed to us. But when does it actually happen where we see the reality of this faith at work in our life, in our church, when we are called. So you got to have the two together. Chosen, yes. Called. Called out of darkness. The darkness of ignorance. The darkness of spiritual blindness. The darkness of sin. The darkness of disobedience out of darkness into His marvelous light. Light represents being enlightened. Light represents understanding. It represents wisdom. It represents the purity of the Lord called out of darkness. We have to be called out of it. We cannot remain in darkness and say we are God's people. It doesn't work. The reality, if we are truly among the chosen, we would be called out of. Jesus would call us out of it. And he has called. It's a question of whether we have come out. If we remain in darkness, if we remain in our sins, in our ignorance, if we do nothing, nothing will happen. Our part is to get out. And when we do, something wonderful happens. Read on. Verse 10 who once were not a people. See, when we were in darkness, we are not a people of God. But now, the people of God, 
who had not obtained mercy, when we were not called out, God's mercy wasn't real. God's mercy isn't appreciated, even though it's shown. It's there, but it's not obtained. But when we are out, we have obtained, now obtained mercy. Look at the word now. Present. This is the present moment. This is our now moment. What is that response? Easter is not just a celebration of a 2,000-year-old tradition or history. It's a celebration of our faith now, of our hope now. It's a celebration of what God is doing right now. It's not just celebration. It is helping us to be conscious. Conscious that we are called. We are chosen. We are called. Christ-centeredness, conscious. And Easter is a wonderful time to help us be so much more conscious of being Christ-centered. And the challenge is to offer a concrete response, is to take concrete action. When Jesus called His disciples, there were those who responded and followed Him, and their lives were changed. Peter is one of them. But there were those who waited, who procrastinated, who never end up following Jesus. There were those who followed for a while, and then when the trials and the afflictions of life came, when problems came, they fled. They didn't follow through. What about us today? This is our now moment. What is our response to the trials that are happening? To the challenges we face? What is our response? Now. Now a people. Now obtain mercy. Now we live by our faith. Now we hope in God. Now. To be that special people. To proclaim the praises of God. This is what God is is doing now. Bev, John and Bev, um, John, Bev called up earlier this week and she was sharing with me how John is going and he's been really unwell. We're thankful he's out of hospital but still going through a rough patch. Not out of the woods. And um, Bev has also been going through, of course, it's been hard. She's the carer. Uh, she's got medical conditions of her own. And then she said to me, you know, uh, Chris, the doctors that helped us, the nurse that was there, even the one who took blood from John, uh, that nurse was a Christian, and she would uh, pray and then take blood. And that just lifted her heart to see God's people in the front line, doing their part, caring for people. This is what it means to be God's special people. We do our part as part of this nation and part of the heavenly kingdom of God. This Easter, wherever we are, we will join our hearts and worship our great King. We serve a risen Savior as that great hymn sings. He's in the world today. I know that He is living, no matter what man may say. How wonderful it is to serve the risen Savior as a royal priesthood. And yes, we celebrate, 
But the celebration will come and the celebration will go. Monday will be a new week. Some got to go back to work. Well, it's a public holiday. Uh, for parents, there is no holiday. Uh, we will carry on. We will have to take care of our uh, children wherever we are. Luxury is, has been redefined. Luxury is no longer going on a holiday. Luxury today is we have food in our fridge. Luxury today is we have health on our side. That is the new luxury. These were basics. The basics have become luxury. And we thank God that our perspective can change through these trials. And my perspective has changed. That life, what faith is, even more, even more conscious of what it means to be Christ-centered. And I wish you a very blessed Easter. Let this Easter for us be one, yes, celebration, but this celebration but must help us to be conscious of who we are as a people of God, chosen, called, Christ-centered. And we are being built as a special people to proclaim the praises of God. May the Lord's name be blessed because of who we are, what we are doing in this time of crisis. Thank God for those who are in the front line. Thank God for those who are working. To have a job is the new luxury, is a new blessing. Thank God for the grace, the mercy that He gives to us for each day. Make this week a wonderful week where we will live by our faith. We will live with our hope. And we thank God that through Christ, we are more than overcomers. We are more than conquerors. Wishing you the Lord's blessing this Resurrection Sunday. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word given to us to help us be conscious that we are chosen and we are called out of darkness into your marvelous light by the Lord Jesus, whom we love and precious to us. Help us to be so conscious of what it means to be Christ-centered, to live by our faith, to stand firm of our foundation in Christ as a living stone, our chief cornerstone. Help us together as a people to face this week the challenges that are ahead with faith, with hope. For those who are in the front line, to care, to find courage, to trust in God as they continue in their work. For all of us, that we may do our part, even if it means to stay at home, that we will prevent the spread of this virus. And we pray for the people, the leaders, those who are affected and have lost lives, during this time. We ask that mercy, that your presence would be with them. Help us, Lord, to celebrate Easter, yes, quietly, in our hearts, in our homes, but yet joyfully, thankfully. We give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.